people are going to have to decide, is Jesus Christ really what they're willing to lay their life down for, or is he not? And you're not going to know that until it's actually required of you. It's easy to say, yes, I love Jesus with all my heart. But if you never do anything about it, how's he going to tell? Jesus said, uh, if you love me, what? You'll keep my commandments. And so it is with the church. Uh, everyone's commandments are, are different. I mean, God gives each one of us a vision. He, God, and I believe he gives us one vision. Some people, it's nothing more than just praying for their family or praying for uh, missionaries or praying for the street preachers. But everyone has a purpose in the, in the church. Everyone, every part of the body is a functional part of God's body. And everything has to be done. All the parts of the body work together. I don't have any part of my body that I don't need. I use every part of it. Even my appendix. And so it is in this particular generation that, that uh, those who name the name of Jesus are going to have to step up. And it's not going to be easy at times. It's going to be hard. The tribulation period is not the time of God's defeat. It is the time of the perfecting of the saints. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews, it says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Yes. And then again in Hebrews it says, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, <coughs> in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The tribulation period is not the overcoming of the church. It is not the defeat of the church. It is God perfecting his people on a wholesale basis so that the church can come out of that period spotless, without any spot or wrinkle, without any blemish, righteousness, Righteousness. Jesus Christ became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That is what's about to happen on the church. The church has to be ready. They have to be told. Uh, they have to prepare themselves. Now, I'm not asking you to, to take the brunt of the attack. Uh, I guess maybe what I'm asking you is if there are some ways that I can talk to people in your churches, I would be glad to do it. I think, though, that uh, many times the, the church doesn't want to hear bad news. They want to hear nothing but good news. Unfortunately, the good news for me is that we are headed into the time of the perfecting of the church. Uh, that's, not, that's good news uh, to anyone who loves God. It's not good news to anyone who loves their pleasure, their comfort, and their ease. Now, let me say just one more thing uh, in case uh, I, I don't particularly, I, I don't want people to suffer, but I find that it's inevitable. But what I do want is for people to triumph over the sufferings. Yes. Suffering is, think about this, everything that happens today in politics is dependent upon a definition of good and evil which we don't necessarily hold to. When you exclude the transcendent values of God, good and bad, right and wrong, mankind is put into a quandary because man is a moral creature. He must have a definition of good and evil. He must. So if there are no transcendent values of good uh, and evil, then mankind satisfies himself with non-transcendent values. And essentially, what happens then is good is equated with pleasure, comfort, and ease. Bad, evil, is equated with pain, suffering, and sorrow. So when you start to think about everything that the government does, everything they do is all aimed, is all controlled by that definition of good and evil. You wonder why the liberals think the conservatives are wicked. Because essentially, they see us advocating uh, 
not advocating for the uh, deliverance from pain, suffering, and sorrow, and the, the uh, providing of pleasure, comfort, and ease. And to them, since that is their definition of good and evil, we must be evil because we accept evil. We accept suffering, and we do. But then our definition of good and evil is not the same as this. Ours is, we will obey God, that's good, and if it means we suffer, that's also good. Because God causes it to work together for our good, even though it's painful at times. Maybe all I could do is ask that you would pray that God would open a door for me uh, to the church so that I can tell people, you got to get ready. This thing's going to get tough. It's going to get worse than you think. And here's some things I think the Lord has shown me. Number one, I don't think we're going to stop very soon in terms of the downward slide. I expect right now there are countries in this world where the unemployment rate is 50%, where they're having food riots in the cities. We are going to see, I think, unemployment getting very close to 50%. We are also on the, on the edge of what's called a mini ice age, that this summer is going to be cold. And the the harvests are going to be cut back as a result of this mini ice age. Uh, in addition to that, all the bees in North America are dying. You know that? All the bees are dying. They don't know why. They can't find a cause for it. But what happens when the bees die? Pollination. No pollination. All of your fruit trees go barren. There is a little jelly-looking tile of a bug that's attacking all the citrus trees in Florida, and now they've found it in California. And it kills the tree in a matter of weeks. Not to mention the drought, the three-year-old drought, which is now in California, and this week they were talking about shutting down irrigation of 400-mile valley in Central California, which is the, essentially the place where they grow most of the vegetables for the entire country. They're going to shut it down. The environmentalists are saying, you can't hurt our streams. Uh, and the farmers are saying, if you shut us down, there won't be any food. Now, now we get over down into Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina. And they're in the third year of drought also. They're, they are uh, telling people, you can't use more than 120 gallons a day, which is about the about uh, one good shower and wash the dishes. That's about 120 gallons. So we are looking at, not only are we looking at an economic downturn, we're looking at an economic collapse. We're looking at an agricultural collapse. We are looking at a time when we could be very soon bordering on a state of martial law. I think that this government would be very quick to declare martial law in order to try and stem the, uh, the collapse. Uh, whether you know this or not, the military has been being trained in uh, crowd control and riot suppression. Our military is not supposed to be used in internal affairs. It's called the Posse Comitatus Act. Uh, the military is not allowed to be used for policing but they are being trained to do it. And they did it in, in New Orleans after Katrina. They had sweeps throughout the neighborhoods in Katrina, busting down doors and seizing all weapons without search warrants. Uh, when there was the flood up in Idaho a couple of months back, they did the same thing. They went through the area, they knocked down doors, they arrested people who said, where's your warrant? And they seized all weapons. These are scary things for me. Because you see, if the military is being trained for the, for the functions of doing what comes uh, from declaring martial law, then I think that they are considering the declaration of martial law uh, in terms of the economic collapse. And if that happens, then civil rights are suspended, because there are no civil rights during martial law. <coughs> 